Someone just said they were having trouble linking to the. Oh, yeah, we're still letting folks in. I, I just want to say that unfortunately I'll have to leave early because I'm going to India. I just wanted to get into the beginning of it. And you will have a transcript, right? Yes, we'll have a transcript and a recording available online. Okay, good. I just wanted to get a sense of how it was happening. Um, okay. Thank you, Dr. Spivak. Great to have you here. Hello, Gayatri. How are you? It's Louis. I so you see you know that I'm going to India. Uh, it's just like a you know I'm like packing while I'm watching. It's a very bad situation. <laughs> you know what I mean? so. Therefore, I just wanted to be there and then buzz off. All right, everyone. So we will begin first with a, a quick spiel by the Spanish interpreters for tonight's event. Hi, uh, the organizers of today's events have made a strong commitment to creating a multilingual space. <clears throat> to that end, we have interpretation available in Spanish and English. Uh, we ask that all participants speak slowly, loud and clear into their microphones to make the interpretation easier. Right after this announcement, we will activate the interpretation feature. And if you're using the Zoom application, you will see a globe icon at the bottom of your screen. To listen to interpretation, click on the globe and select English. If you're using the Zoom, uh, uh, Zoom on your phone, click on the three dots where it says more. Choose language interpretation and select English. And if you have any problems, uh, please leave a comment in the chat box. Eh, hola, los organizadores del evento de hoy tienen la firme determinación de crear un espacio multilingüe. Y con esa finalidad, contamos con interpretación disponible en español e inglés. Les pedimos a todos los participantes que hablen lentamente y en voz alta y clara en sus micrófonos para facilitar la interpretación. Al terminar este anuncio, activaremos la función de interpretación y, si usted está usando la aplicación Zoom, podrá ver el icono de un mundo en la parte de abajo de su pantalla. Haga un clic en el icono del mundo para escuchar la interpretación y selección español. Si usted está usando la aplicación Zoom desde su teléfono, haga clic en los tres puntitos donde dice More. Seleccione Language Interpretation y después Español. Si tienen algún problema al hacer esto, por favor, dejen un comentario en el chat y gracias. Okay, good evening and immense gratitude to everyone for joining us here tonight for the School of Tony Cade Bambara with ASL Interpretation by Andrea and Brandon and Spanish Interpretation by Ali and Julieta which is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube. This is the fifth of seven online public events for the November through January residency, Radiating Black Puerto Rican Feminist Studies from the City University of New York to the Americas and the Caribbean, being coordinated with the Brooklyn Community Center, Wendy's Subway, with support from the CUNY Graduate Center's Lost and Found, the CUNY Poetics Document Initiative from the Center for the Humanities, also the Center for Place, Culture, and Politics. With Brooklyn College, Ethel R. Wolf Institute for the Humanities, Africana Studies Department, American Studies Program, and Puerto Rican and Latino Studies Department. And finally, City College's Latin American and Latino Studies Program. My name is Connor Tomas Reed. I welcome all pronouns. I currently teach at Brooklyn College in CUNY and I organized with Free CUNY and Rank and File Action, or RAFA. I wish to thank tonight's participants, Linda Holmes, Makiba Lavan, Thabiti Lewis, and Louis Messiah. Also the Wendy Subway team, in particular, Rachel Valinsky and Sunny Ayer, and every single one of you out there tonight for joining us for this beautiful event. And I see some have already done so, but I invite everyone to share in the chat where you're connecting from so we can learn how far and wide that we're reaching towards each other tonight. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that I'm reaching to you from the homeland of the Lenape and the Canarsie people, which is and always has been a place of indigenous movement. Our work today and ongoing at its most fundamental level is in solidarity with the Lenape, Canarsie, and all indigenous peoples here and beyond whose land was stolen to create settler states and who continue to live under siege, surveillance, 
and colonial structural violence on their own occupied land. We align with all those advancing indigenous resurgence and decolonization in the face of colonial oppression. We support the return of their lands. This acknowledgement is a call to commit and to take on the responsibility to dismantle the ongoing effects of settler colonialism. This is where together we must begin and persist. In connection, part of our ongoing entwined practices of liberation is to both envision and enact radical learning counter institutions wherever we are. Across her life, in New York, New Jersey, Alabama, Atlanta, and Philadelphia, and in solidarity trips to Cuba and Vietnam, Tony Cade Bambara modeled what it meant to dedicate ourselves to each other in beloved communities that can be sustained through the ebbs and flows of historical upheavals. In the late 1960s at the City College of New York in Harlem, she was one of the first teachers in the Sikh program who worked with Black and Puerto Rican students. And alongside such colleagues as June Jordan and Audre Lorde, who we've also highlighted in this event series, to ultimately transform the university's admissions, curriculum, and overall learning and working conditions. We still invoke these lessons today at CUNY. As you will hear tonight, Bambara continued these commitments throughout her life in such avenues as teaching, writing, filmmaking, movement organizing, and friendship until her all too early transition in 1995. Near the end of this most challenging year of 2020, we want to celebrate the 50th and 40th anniversaries of her 1970 anthology, The Black Woman, and 1980 novel, The Salt Eaters, among the rest of her cultural interventions that can transmit wisdom for the myriad fires in our time. I am deeply inspired to introduce these participants tonight who have worked directly with Bambara and through her legacy. I'll now read their bios and then we'll hear from them in this order to traverse the chronology of Bambara's life, followed by ample time for questions, answers, and hopefully some good dialogue. First, we will hear from Makiba Lavan who is an assistant professor of English at Grinnell College. Her research focuses on African-American studies, Afrofuturism, speculative fiction, and popular culture. Makiba's intellectual musings have been published in Afrocology, the Journal of Pan-African Studies, and Modern Language Studies. As part of Lost and Found, the CUNY Poetics Document Initiative, she co-edited Realizing the Dream of a Black University and Other Writings a collaborative publication of Tony Cade Bambara's teaching materials from CUNY and Spelman College. Her current project explores the ways in which writers and artists of the African diaspora use speculative fiction to imagine and thus create better futures for Black people. Linda J. Holmes is a writer, independent scholar, curator, and longtime women's health activists. She is the author of the 2014 book, A Joyous Revolt, Tony Cade Bambara, writer and activist, and co-editor with Cheryl Wall of the 2007 anthology, Savoring the Salt, The Legacy of Tony Cade Bambara. Her 1996 book co-authored co with Margaret Charles Smith is Listen to Me Good, The Life Story of an Alabama Midwife. Holmes is currently working on a second book about midwives of African descent across the diaspora, past and present, as well as collecting oral histories from Hampton Institute civil rights veterans who were in the forefront of the 1960s movement to desegregate public spaces in Virginia. Habiti Lewis is professor of English and associate vice chancellor for academic affairs at Washington State University, Vancouver. He is the author of Ballers of the New School, Race and Sports in America, 2010, the editor of Conversations with Tony Cade Bambara, 2012, with University of Mississippi Press, a collection of Bambara's important interviews, and most recently, Black People Are My Business, Tony Cade Bambara's Practices of Liberation, which just came out this year in 2020. Lewis is also the co-director and co-producer with Pavithra Narayan of the documentary film, BAM, Chicago's Black Arts Movement. 2019. 
As a literary critic, Lewis engages critical race theory and feminism. Lewis has been focused on re-examining the Black arts movement, as well as using sports culture to help people better understand, become aware of, and eliminate racism in our society. We'll finally hear from Louis Messiah, a documentary filmmaker and founder of Scribe Video Center. Through Scribe, he assists emerging filmmakers to author their own stories, including the Precious Places Community History Project, Muslim Voices of Philadelphia, and The Great Migration, A City Transformed. Messiah's documentaries include The Bombing of Osage Avenue, W.E.B. Du Bois, A Biography in Four Voices, and How to Make a Flower. Other projects include video installations for The President's House, Freedom and Slavery in the Making of a Nation, and the Musée de Civilisation Noir in Dakar, Senegal. Louis Messiah is the project director and co-programmer of We Tell 50 Years of Participatory Community Media. First, we will hear from Akiba. Please take it. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yes, make sure. Okay, well, good evening. Thank you so much for having me. I'm always so honored to discuss Tony K. Bambara, who feels like an aunt to me at this point. Um, I also was a Sikh student. I feel like it's important to acknowledge that given her legacy. Um, also shout out to Connor Tomas Reed, my partner in pedagogical deeds and imaginations. Um, I have to start this presentation with a brief outline of the project's genesis. So I began thinking about this project in around 2015, I think. Um, it seems like 50 years ago now, but it was not. Um, I got the uh, fellowship from the CUNY, uh, the City University of New York's Lost and Found Project, which publishes well-known archival works from known poets. Um, lesser known, sorry. Connor and I teamed up to work on Bambara's chapbook in 2016, making two trips to Spelman College, first to investigate the archives, shout out to Cassandra Ware and Holly Smith, who are the best archivists ever, uh, and then the following year to present our work at the annual Tony K. Bambara Scholar Activism Conference, which happens biannually in March to com commemorate her birthday. The major challenge we encountered in conducting our archival research was time. Archival research is messy, metaphorically speaking, and sometimes physically speaking. The materials of a person's life can suck you in very quickly. Sometimes it's hard to stay on task. But the archives at Spelman College were wonderful and it was a very welcoming space. Our main investigation focused on the ways in which particular activists, pedagogues, were, um, who spent their time teaching at CUNY were able to marry their black radical ideals with their work as educators and creative writers. Their pedagogical examples paint a picture of the necessity of teaching and learning as resistance. So while Toni K. Bambara is most known for her short stories, novels, and the landmark 1970 anthology, The Black Woman, and I have, I'm stealing this, this is my aunt's, um, an original uh, copy, is, um, so she's most known for that, um, The Black Woman Realizing the Dream of a Black University and other writings, um, explores lesser known aspects of her work and revives her far reaching pedagogical legacy. Through memoirs and texts drawn from City University of New York's radical 1960s educational experiments, we learn how Bambara dedicated her life to embedding and expanding Black and Third World studies in academic institutions, community settings, and the larger collective consciousness while imbuing these efforts with her own unique form of infectious activism and unflinching clarity. She once described her purpose in an interview with Kay Bonetti by saying that, quote, 
as a cultural worker who belongs to an oppressed people, my job is to make revolution irresistible, end quote. Um, and that um, interview is in um, conversations with uh, Tony K. Bambara, which was published by um, Tabidi Lewis. In her essay, Programming with School Days, Bambara refers to herself as an activist pedagogue. The title is perfect in that it highlights her approach to education and community. My first introduction to Tony K. Bambara came through this very essay in a graduate course taught by Candace M. Jenkins. The class, Black and Bourgeois in the Flesh, Class, Sex, and the Racial Body, examined how African-American writers in the late 20th and early 21st centuries grapple with the question of black class privilege, excuse me, and particularly with an inherent tension between the racialized excess of embodiment that accrues to notions of blackness and the tendency of privilege to mask or erase the body's traces. It seems only fitting that I learned of such an important CUNY alumna in the CUNY graduate course. Bambara's pedagogy rests heavily on how to think critically and thus write critically through a global third world lens. In her teaching, she challenges students to fully investigate the world and the spaces in which they occupy. Among her correspondence at Spelman College are letters written to her by a 10th grade teacher and some of her students from Chamberlain High School in Tampa, Florida. The assignment was given after the class read Blues Ain't No Mockingbird, and they were told by their teacher to write and, quote, ask questions of the authors. The letters were really cute and thoughtful. Myers writes about her students, quote, being able to actually write you a letter has made you and your story more real to them. You are no longer just a bland picture in their boring book, end quote. This teacher embodied Bambara's pedagogical approach, that language is alive and transformative. So I hate when people say, you know, so-and-so was a product of their time because it's usually a euphemism for some manner of, you know, bigotry or atrocity. And realistically, isn't it true of all of us? We're all products of our time. However, if we are open to it, and or fortunate enough to have someone cultivate the thirst for knowledge in us, we may also become students of our elders in history. But Bambara is careful to distinguish and divorce historical knowledge from institutions. She was not precious about history and doesn't place it on a pedestal. In fact, in the preface to The Black Woman, which was published 50 years ago this year, she systematically critiques the ways that various fields of study have failed to provide us with paths to liberation. She says of history particularly, quote, the very movements that could provide us with insights are those movements not traditionally taught in the schools or made available without glamorized distortions by show business, end quote. Even still, According to Tony, the value in history, if nothing else, is that, quote, it shows us the need for unified effort and the value of a vision of a society substantially better than the existing one, end quote. The anthology gathered Black and third world feminist women of all walks of life, including Black and Puerto Rican women who were students and teachers from City College and CUNY to redirect energies from a decade of social upheaval that nonetheless perpetuated racism and sexism. Similarly, Bambara's teaching practice focused heavily on community-based learning. She understood that physical classrooms were created for a certain type of learning, one that was not made for or welcoming to non-white people. So on one hand, her syllabi reflected the need to change that. And she peppered her courses with texts from women she greatly admired, such as Adrienne Rich, Audre Lorde, June Jordan, 
Maxine Hahn King, King, uh, Kingston. Her teaching assignments were invitations to think critically and get involved in one's community and world. At the same time, Bambara encouraged learning everywhere she went, from community centers to gardens, living rooms, and workspaces. She also demonstrates ways to create democratic learning spaces. She entered the classroom as a learning educator and made sure that her students understood that everyone brought valuable knowledge to the learning space. She evaluated the, te uh, the students' oral, written, and activist work so that student assessment occurred on multiple levels with a variety of competencies and intelligences acknowledged. Bambara was practical in her approach to teach teaching writing, getting down into the nitty gritty details and asking her students to identify their favorite writing implements and making sure that they had ready workspaces, even mentioning that she's, quote, game to make house calls and Columbo a place, end quote. Of course, now this is a reference that most of my students do not understand. They have no idea who Columbo is. But planning a writing space in one's home necessitates what she called, quote, the hard question. How do you educate family and friends to respect your need and right to be unavailable at times, end quote. Mumbara sought to remove the most basic impediments to writing. She was also modeling intentionality for her students, showing them that writing wasn't just something that happened. We must literally create space for it. Her dreams of a black university weren't a shallow diversity and inclusion project. It involved way more than simply adding black students, teachers and courses to existing racial capitalist, white supremacist institutional structures. It meant examining and eliminating disciplinary boundaries, identifying and welcoming knowledge bases outside of the university that flourished inside poor multi-ethnic neighborhoods and creating a partisan liberatory relationship to collective studies. She was a lifelong student, a writer, activist, teacher, storyteller, and overall cultural worker. She was determined to bring her whole self to her work and art, and this also showed up in her melding of disciplines in course design. As Connor wrote in our chapbook, quote, here we can see the thematic timeline she developed throughout her life, one that could demonstrate to her readers and students how to navigate the complexities of geography, family, motherhood, social movements, the creative process, and mortality, end quote. I can be tough. I can be tough. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry people. I don't know what just happened. I don't know what that um, was either. We're with you though, Makiba. We're with you. Okay. You're just <laughs> a little thing on the screen though, because I'm reading. So sorry about that. Um no in her in her 1972 essay, Black English, Bambara writes. Um, in school, we have focused on language as the noun, not on what or who is named or on who is doing the naming. In school, we do not emphasize the real function of language in our lives, how it operates in courts, in hospitals, in schools, in the media, how it operates to perpetuate a society, maintain a social order, to reflect biases, to transmit basic values. In fact, her active involvement in the multi-ethnic dimensions of Harlem shaped her goal to help produce studies that related Black people's histories to those of other communities also struggling against institutional and interpersonal racism in the United States, at home and also abroad. She stressed interconnectedness of communities and systems as the poison and the antidote. Bambara wrote, quote, the society has rewards for those who demonstrate skills and nimble avoidance of uncomfortable realities that threaten the bogus peace, but no mercy for those who penetrate, who dare penetrate the social garments and speak out on the emperor's new clothes. 
end quote. When I think about Bambara's teaching practice, I think of the closing words. Her dedication to quote, the uptown mamas who nudged me to just set it down in print so that it gets to be a habit to write letters to each other. So maybe that way we won't keep the same old ground. This is the spirit of Tony K. Bambara. On this, the 50th anniversary of those words immortalized in print, Ms. Bambara is, is still inviting us to enter the space of learning, teaching, and doing, while giving us a blueprint for how these three must go hand in hand. The lesson left in her books and archive present us with a way to continue breaking new ground. Thank you. Andre, I'll take a look from here. Thank you, Makiba. Thank you. And apologies to everyone for a, a couple of uh, a couple of interruptions. We are now going to watch a video with Linda Janet Holmes's remarks, and Linda will be is here with us and uh, will be joining live uh, during the the question and answer and dialogue section. So now, uh, Rachel or Sunny, if you could. I uh, start the video with Linda's remarks. Thank you. in college and beyond. I met Tony K. Thank you, Connor, for inviting me to the exciting opportunity, the school of Tony K. from the has begun here, uh, will be continuing, and I look forward to hearing more about the project. So Tony K. Bambara at Liverpool I'm sorry, there's, um, I just need to resolve something. Sorry. One second, apologies for the inconvenience. Uh, at Lemmings. Thanks, Connor, for inviting me to participate in this exciting opportunity, the School of Tony Kate Bambara. Um, I'm excited that the work that has begun here uh, will be continuing, and I look forward to hearing more about the project. So, Tony Kate Bambara at Lemmings College and beyond. I met Tony Kate Bambara in 1990. She was living in Spanish Harlem. Tony always thought of herself as a woman of Harlem. She um, spent her early childhood years in Harlem. She saw Harlem as home base, and of course, all of her work at City College. And Harlem was in her. It was her love for jazz, her love for film, her love for dance, her respect for activism. But when Tony decided to begin working at Livingston College, she didn't leave Harlem behind. She brought Harlem with her. So Livingston College actually opens in 1969, and it is the year after the 1968 rebellion. Hands up, don't shoot, um, is 400 years of Black history in America. But the reason I chose to move into why Livingston College with this slide is because 1960s, when I was then a student at Douglas College, was the beginning of the radical revolutionary Black student movement uh, of demands for Black faculty, Black history. There was um, one adjunct Black faculty at Douglas when I started school there. There were no courses in Black history. There were um, no 
um, opportunities for black students to gather in a black house. And all of that changed the beginning with the uh, black student movements across the country following the assassination of Martin Luther King. But when the governor signed legislation creating Livingston College, it was an event that happened as a result of the revolt and the cries for justice in black communities. So what the governor might have had in mind with uh, opening Livingston and the plan that Tony had in mind, Tony always said, you got to have a plan was probably as different as night and day. So Tony comes to Livingston creating a concept of developing a black university within the state university of Rutgers University in New Jersey. Livingston was a newly opened campus, and I think campus is an, is an exaggeration of the term. It was a couple of buildings in the middle of a veterans uh, military abandoned uh, Kilmer camp. And the buildings were barely opened uh, when Tony arrived in the summer program of 1969. But what this picture evokes is that Tony K. Bambara, not only at Livingston, Livingston College, but throughout her life, in her work with community, in her work with students, it was always about the collective. Tony is never centering herself outside of the community. It's always within the community. Students are uh, see Tony as someone. I took a class with Tony, and I remember Tony standing more on the side of the room than in the front of the room. That was who Tony was. And so when you look at this image, you have the idea of the circle, the collective. Tony would teach classes outdoors as much as she taught classes indoors. That is who Tony was and who Tony continued to be throughout her life. But Tony was serious about teaching. Um, and Tony um, introduces the idea of a very interdisciplinary um, coursework, but very rigorous, even though we were, uh, Livingston was considered this incredible experiment where students were grading themselves. But Tony K. Bambara in her class, um, it was not just a matter of self-assessing, but it was also, um, Tony created the concept of once you decide upon your grade, then you come back to the class and you present that grade to your comrades in the classroom and there may be some debate there may be some questioning but those questions are going to come from your peers and then we will come to some kind of collective agreement about where the justified grade needs to be um, tony of course whenever she taught wherever she taught was always including um, uh, dance and music and film and the arts and so what Tony created at Livingston was not simply what she was doing in her classroom, but she also was creating a collective um, in terms of the faculty. There were faculty that came to Livingston that never would have come to Livingston if Tony had not reached out to them or that Tony was not creating this cultural base that welcomed creativity, that welcomed celebrating blackness. Um, Nikki Giovanni was living in New York uh, not far from where Tony was living, and they often would ride over to campus together. Sonia Sanchez was at Livingston for several years, and Pepsi Charles came to Livingston. She was doing a radio program on WBAI, Pacifica Radio, and Tony liked what she was hearing in terms of her connecting and interconnecting with community. This quote, just briefly, uh, George Levine, who was the chair of the department, um, was talking about Livingston and Tony Kate's influence. And um, I let the women, I, the uh, white male chairperson, I, let the women um, teach their women classes and the blacks teach their black classes. And I don't see how not to. So that was the, you know, the revealing part of the sentence. 
And yeah, so black power was very strong on the campus. And Tony K. Babar had a lot to do with creating the spaces and creating spaces where prior um, pre Tony, in terms of my interacting with black student movements, there were often these camps, the Muslim camp, the Black Panther camp, um, the Black Christian camp. But Tony was really about breaking down those barriers and creating a collective in terms of the black student movement on campus. So Tony film, Tony um, community immersion, but tales and stories for black folks is uh, very similar to the book that she edited um, that came out um, while I was, I think right after I graduated from, from A Curse of the Black Woman, um, which brings together student works alongside, um, you know, Langston Hughes and others. But what the assignment was for Tales and Slipped, what eventually became Tales and Stories for Black Folks was, these white oriented European children's stories just don't um, relate to our children. And so tales for black folks, I ended up writing the story of the true story of Chicken Licken. It wasn't um, the sky falling that hit her over the head. It was the, the, uh, the bat of a, uh, the billy club of a, a white policeman. And she organizes the, 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 the black barnyard march to, to city hall to demand justice. So community immersion. Once you write the story, where do you read the story? Do you take it back to the Chad School, the independent black school in York? Um, do you talk with Amiri Baraka at Spirit House? Do you take it back to your church? And then the assignment of um, what do you know about your own family history? Go talk to your grandmother. So Tony um, spends years, maybe I think it probably was three or four years at Livingston because I was not there during her final two years. It was a difficult time, but everyone who I talked to in the process of writing A Joyous Revolt talks about how Tony created a kind of self-revolution, a revolution within a development of the plan, a plan which continued to shape much of their lives. When Tony goes to Alabama, to Atlanta initially, but she's, this image is of Tony in Alabama, working with um, a farm workers a movement, uh, black women who were quilt makers, uh, former sharecroppers. Tony is working at the Neighborhood Art Center, but again, creating community, not putting herself on stage, but putting collective work in the forefront. And Tony's idea of organizing wherever you are was certainly in the lifelong spirit of Tony as a teacher and as someone who was always accessible and as someone who was always making the connections. When I read um, uh, John Hendrick Clark's book, um, short story on uh, the boy who painted Christ Black, I was just so knocked out by it. I was like, well, you know, tell me more about John Hendrick Clark. And Tony said, she pulls out her phone book which is, was the internet before the internet, and says, oh, all right, um, let me call uh, John Henry Clark and tell him I'm sending a student over because you've got some questions for him. And so I met John Henry Clark at his home, and she told me when you, the, the assignment was, if you're going to go see John Henry Clark, you must also stop by the Schomburg Library. Life-changing community immersion was what Tony was all about. And the message of organize where you are, I also spent time in Tony's class, community immersion um, in Bed Stuyvesant, um, finding out about the black teacher strike that was going on there, fight for justice, um, telling the teachers there about the true story of chicken licken. Tony K. Bambara, throughout her life, continues not to look for the full-time teaching appointment she was an assistant professor, was her appointment at Livingston. But what she was looking for was contact with students for helping to um, be at the table or sitting on the grass or sitting in the car, as one of my friends told me in Alabama, sitting in the car overnight, talking about bringing Bernice Reagan and other African-American feminists community activist leaders 
to the first women's con conference at the University of Alabama. That was the kind of work that Tony continued to do at Livingston College and beyond. So that was what a joyous revolt <laughs> is all about. And I um, really want to close with saying that Tony was always about the we, not about the I in her teaching at Livingston, in her community activism, in her film work. And she was also about the roll call. So um, everything that I do, um, I, I think about that. And I also, I'm working now on um, the roll call in terms of celebrating black midwives in the South and who have been, uh, whose practices were wiped out. And when I was sharing that work with Tony K. Bambara, Tony said, um, all of that history is interesting and, and tape recording their stories. But what's really needed, I think, is a discussion about how do you form the midwife union. That was one of Tony's teaching themes. Return to the community, connect it with, Africa, with, with um, activism, and make the interconnections, pan-Africanism, uh, Black feminism, um, community work, um, community immersion. And as Tony K. Bambara said at Tuskegee, it is never, Harriet Tubman said, it is never about the I. It is always about the we. Thank you, Connor, for inviting me to share very rapidly some uh, thoughts about why Tony K. Bambara has influenced the activism and work of so many people who are continuing the work today. Thanks again, Connor. Thank you so much, Linda. And everyone will get to hear from Linda during the uh, question and answer uh, and, and dialogue portion. Uh, now we'll get to hear from the BT. You have the floor. Oh, and uh, if you can turn yourself off of mute. I do this all day, and of course, uh, at this moment, <laughs> I would not have it. You know, I, I want to thank our previous uh, speakers because it, you you both wonderfully set the tone of uh, my inquiry into her work, um, and it makes it make wonderful sense. You know, I'm from St. Louis, and uh, growing up, you know, my family, you know, took me to breakfast programs, marches, uh, protests, and when I uh, studied English and history at the University of Rochester uh, was the was one of the first time I formally uh, interact you know met Tony K Bambara and uh, was really blown away in a Black women writers course uh, as a sophomore uh, and um, you know those that ex those experiences and interacting with her work had a really profound impact on me that uh, balanced my intellectual development uh, from uh, from this exploring her work. And um, even when I was in high school, my mother had a copy of the uh, her anthology, The Black Woman, uh, lying around. And I just sort of skimmed it a little bit. But um, you know, when I was in graduate school, over the course of you know, working on this project, uh, and then uh, over the years, and of course the edited book, I I, I really I'm a student of Bambara's life's principles such as the demand for truth and community and uh, activism and equality and graciousness and patience for people seeking to come into consciousness. Uh, I, she has really impacted the way in which I interact with my daughters, my wife, uh, young people in the community in general. Uh, and Bambara has brought me into contact with people such as Linda and Louis Masai, Eleanor Trailer. Uh, Linda, when I talked to her on the phone, shared stories with me about uh, Tony and Louis, literally, Louis Masai literally didn't even know me from Adam and opened his door to me. And I was not surprised because of their connection. And he just talked to me about her. And so, um, you know, what I've done here in seven chapters is really just in this book, uh, Black People Are My Business, um, um, which you know, I could still be writing it because I think she's such a profound figure is I really wanted to the readers to know 
uh, that Bambara is a really important and understudied um, Black feminist writer and, and really a pioneering voice for the contemporary feminist struggle and historical Black struggle for freedom, um, which, you know, uh, begins with her uh, landmark, The Black Woman, right? Uh, I think that work confirms this point about her. Um, so the title of the book, Black People Are My Business, uh, really it comes out of the essay, Deep Sighting Rescue Missions. And she, and it comes from, you know, just, uh, I remember reading that essay and there's, you know, this, uh, I'll give you the anecdote where she tells her daughter who is, you know, karma, who's telling her mom, you know, you need to stay out of folks' business. And she says to karma, sugar, Black people are my business. And I said, that's it. That is the title of this book because it captures the essence of Bambara. And so, you know, uh, the other, the third thing I try to uh, convey in this book is that Bambara extends the ideals and she negotiates the tensions between black nationalism and feminism in women's fiction of the 1970s and 80s, different from her contemporaries. And uh, I would say perhaps better than her contemporaries, Bambara's liberation impulse really privileges the process and the practices of the work of the people, the people doing what? Educating themselves into cultivating a cl critical consciousness. As you were listening to Linda talk, um, that really is the essence as you're reading uh, Gorilla My Love, if you're reading The Seabirds, if you're reading you know, The Salt Eaters, those bones, uh, especially those early collections of fictions. So I, I see Bambara as having a real unique trans ideological, transnational and an, an intersectional approach that I think was unmatched by many of her peers and uh, her fiction is steeped in the black aesthetic tradition of transaction between writer and reader and performer and audience. It is there. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm in, in each chapter of this book, I'm, I'm trying to examine Bambara's really robust liberation impulse that, uh, that I think uh, infuses a very robust black feminist thrust in the black arts movement principles such as change, dialectical ontology and transcending double consciousness. Um, uh, and so I, I'm really seeing her fiction as this sort of intersectional blueprint for challenging patriarchy and eliminating gender hegemony and building a spiritually whole community. So one of my, one of my uh, uh, among the many interests that I have in her work is how she utilizes a black vernacular along with realism and modernism to recover what I call a spiritual wholeness aesthetic uh, that I construct to uh, examine her work. And that spiritual wholeness aesthetic, it centers around um, what Don Matthews calls this focus on family, faith, feeling, and freedom, family, faith, feeling and freedom and you know those themes and uh, these principles de-emphasize personal gain in favor of values such as social justice, moral consciousness, social consciousness, and a resistance to sexism, racism, and pro poverty producing capitalism and corruption. So when you read a story like The Lesson, that's what she's focusing in on, right? It's always about developing consciousness and building. And uh, someone once uh, categorized her work as children's stories. And I said, no, this is, these are liberation stories. This is liberation impulse. It's just the gorilla my love is that sort of rudimentary and, and is steeped in, you know, if you look at the stories in Gorilla My Love, uh, you see her bridging this gap between generations, elders and youth and young people being, the, you know, in the Black Arts Movement, the focus was ancient to the future. It was, you know, young people and then, you know, and being tied in the sort of ancestral connections. And then what does that future be? What will that future be? What will we become? This idea of becoming. So I think she, so she really leans into the Black aesthetic uh, and privilege that privileges ancestors, right? And so, uh, and, and her work, she keeps that moment from being static by making it new, new through the voices of youth and women. So um, I'm constantly looking at how her liberation impulse privileges process, uh, its practices, repair and sustain community. And so from story to story, 
from novel to novel, her fiction serves, in, in my estimation, three primary functions, unite the community, include female voices in discussion of black culture and life. And finally, this notion of opening multiple approaches to reading African-American life, you know, life and culture, right? Uh, so the people is key to my spiritual wholeness aesthetic, which again, emphasizes family and faith. Faith in what? Faith in ourselves and the community, the nations and the power of the consciousness building. Feeling, meaning, do we touch the spiritual core of African diasporic culture for answers from the gospel and blues and jazz and spirituals and the sermonics? And of course, freedom, which uh, you know people of color are still trying to achieve in this world, especially in this country. So uh, in, in all these chapters, I'm really sort of playing with this. And I know I have a few minutes and I there's a one of her stories that I think uh, people don't pay enough attention to that I just wanna talk about. And I'm gonna read from just a, a page or two from the book. Uh, it's called Christmas Eve at Johnson's uh, Drugs and Goods. And it's a wonderful story because it really, and you, I'll talk about it, but it captures this essence of this, this black arts moment and this idea of finding alternative uh, cultural constructions. And so if you could give me a second, I would just like to, um, to read the short passage from it. In this story, the black owned store, uh, Kwanzaa and Bambara's iteration of Kawaita represent the new rules and reality that black power demanded. The story is Bambara's response to black power, to the, to the black power movement call for blacks as a group to find new ways to relate to one another and determine their own goals and activities. Obatali and Candy model the behavior of a new man and woman coming together to share revolutionary love. Bambara conjures a new political posturing um, and a psychological metamorphosis using Kawaida. In addition, the positive new indigenous viewpoint ensconced in Kwanzaa purports far from second class status and promises Candy a new foundation upon which to build her budding womanhood. Candy, who has not spent much time with her mom or dad pre-Christmas, opens up these possibilities when she remarks, maybe there's something joyous about this Kwanzaa celebration he's talking about, because Lord knows Christmas is a drag. The phraseology Lord knows emphasizes the spiritual truth that she has lost faith, and that traditional in that traditional holiday has failed to meet her expectations. As Candy considers Obatali's inv invitation to attend Kwanzaa, she remembers that she received a similar invitation from the sister who taught her how to rap the gili. This is important for Bambara's committed to proffering healthy gender balanced solutions and role models. Furthermore, Similar to other stories in the collection of Seabirds, namely Broken Field Running and A Girl Story, in this story, a Black community center offers an oasis, a liberation zone, for young women and men, like uh, young men and women like Candy, trying to shape who they will become. The story's conclusion is significant, powerful, undetermined, under, I mean, undetermined, and filled with hope. Not only is its discussion of Kwanzaa a recitation on Black people living and respecting one another, but it also invokes Kawaita as a viable practice of liberation for Candy's, Candy, a budding feminist and nationalist. Moreover, the formation of a friendship or mentorship between a man and woman that is not romantic is significant. In fact, it is one of the most important practices of liberation and a reminder that revolutionary love comes in all shapes, sizes, and gender. It is also fitting that the last story in the collection celebrates feminism, Black nationalism, and an alternative value system in the guise of the Kawaida. In seeking alternatives to the spirit of the Black arts movement, Bambara rejects vertical hierarchy and ends with a story that suggests something new, that suggests something new might be considered. The art of this final story is a wonderful example of second wave black arts movement because it models being a breath of the future as it tries to fashion the new way 
or what Baraka in Kawaita Studies New Nationalism called a pathway toward national liberation and the new consciousness of the million year old personality. This final story in the Seabirds collection is uh, in general, artfully practices and performs national liberation and a new consciousness whereby black men and women complement each other, create the environment together and are equally responsible for inspiring and raising the spirits of the people to defend and develop this new consciousness. Writing in the Black Collegian in 1980 in an essay called What It Means to Be a Black Woman, Bambara says the conditions Black people were struggling against were as follows. Relent, relentlessness, a relentless racist oppression, the orchestrated antagonisms between sisters and brothers, the insidious manipulation of our token class and the persistent downtrodden downpressing of the mass of mass folk and the trivializing and commercializing of our artistic endeavors. Given these challenges, she believed it was her duty to make revolution irresistible. It is only fitting that I end with Bambara's words as they shape my theoretical paradigm and guide my thinking about her fiction. I return to the Black Collegian essay where she explains, oppression is not our only reality. It is not even our paramount reality. It is definitely not our permanent reality, struggle is, and community is, and imagination is. The struggle against all constraints and imposed limitations on the body, mind, psyche, spirit, vision of real community, principled and potent relationships with ourselves, each other, other communities, and with all the forces of the universe, that is our history. That is still the challenge. And in the challenge, and is the challenge, and in that challenge, our opportunity individually and collectively. Now, that to me is irresistible love of self and the people. This is what Bambara conjures in some form or fashion in her fiction. Her art lovingly and irresistibly tells truths, celebrates struggle, and fights to cultivate a feeling of commitment to family, faith, feeling, and freedom. And so I, I just wanted to read that because I think that captures the essence of Bambara and what I'm trying to do as I'm examining her work and uh, her vision as a leader, um, um, as an intellectual. All right, thank you so much, Baviti. And we'll put in the chat, uh, there's a link to be able to get uh, a special uh, discount for the copy of the book coming out from Wayne State University Press. So we'll put that in the chat in one moment. And uh, right now, Louie, you have the floor, our final speaker, before we get into some questions, some answers, some dialogue. Um, so stay with us. We're with you, Louie. Thanks so much, Connor. Can, can, can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Wow, what, what a great honor to be part of this panel and a great honor to be connected with others who are interested in, in the gift of Tony Cade Bambara and the, and the issues raised by Connor Tom Tomas Reed in this series of gatherings on radiating Black Puerto Rican feminist studies from the City University of New York to the Americas and the Caribbean. A mouthful, but, but the title has deep personal meaning to me, radiating suggests a cosmological grounding. Black is my prime lens. Puerto Rican is an acknowledgement of kinship and also salvation from binary constructions from myopia. Plus Puerto Rico is the homeland of my mother's godfather. Feminist studies to me, a black man, suggests a possibility of freedom, a beloved community, a liberating perspective. City University of New York, one of my most wonderful teaching experiences, in the Americas reminds me that we, we still must find a more just, less burdened name for this hemisphere. Caribbean, my, my parents' birthland, a place of deep inspiration for me. And I also really am I'm so pleased to be connected with, with Wendy Subway and I hope uh, we can do, Scribe Video Center can do some sort of collaboration with Wendy's in future. It's good being with, with Connor and Makiba who I will, forever be grateful for, for their two volume edition on uh, Tony K. Bambar's writing that, that we've seen in, in the Lost and Found series. And, and I, I must say that it's been my, my Kwanzaa solstice gift of choice for the last few years. Tabidi Lewis, whose scholarship gives me hope and light. 
and Linda Janet Holmes, whose friendship is another one of Tony's marvelous gifts. Uh, Linda, oral historian, health advocate, and biographer extraordinaire of Tony Cade Bambara. Uh, I've taken heed to Linda's advice and written out my comments for this talk rather than giving it the usual independent filmmakers ex extemporaneous ramble. So my talk is called Tony's Workshop. I, I wanted to share a poem by Gwendolyn Brooks, which has resonance for this evening. I think Tabidi knows what I'm going to read. Uh, Tony was very much about understanding, acknowledging, and claiming lineage. And Gwendolyn Brooks was often a name that, that Tony called. So Paul Robeson by Gwendolyn Brooks. That time we all heard it, cool and clear, cutting across the hot grit of the day, the major voice, the adult voice foregoing rolling river, foregoing tearful tale of bale and barge and other symptoms of an old despond, warning in music words, devout and large, that we are each other's harvest, we are each other's business, we are each other's magnitude and bond. We, we know from Tony's biography that Tony wearing the broad mantle of cultural worker was many things in her work life, writer, editor, dancer, model, social worker, community organizer, delegate, and certainly educator occupied a significant part of her life and time. But cinema and filmmaking became more and more a focus of Tony K. Bambara's work. I, I'm working on a documentary uh, primer on Tony Cade Bambara's life uh, that we are calling the TCB School of Organizing. So there's great resonance with what what uh, Connor's put together. I say we because it's been a project that has come out of a lot of collective support and vision, specifically working with Karma Bene Smith and the pretty extraordinary archives and Women's Resource Center at Spelman College, where Tony's papers are housed. Uh, with Eleanor Trailer, and this film was edited by my good friend, um, Monica Enriquez. So, um, so, so Tony used the space and structure of the workshop to do so much of her work uh, in film. The workshop is a place for learning, experimentation, sisterly, brotherly, camaraderie, sharing, discussion, and perhaps most importantly, creativity. It, it is very much part of, of a filmmaking process. The community workshop tradition really has been fertile ground for so many important artists. I'm thinking of Julie Dash, studying at the Studio Muse Museum in Harlem while in high school, or Yancey Ford at Third World Newsreel, the filmmakers at Cartemquin and Chicago Community Workshop, Apple Shop in, in Kentucky, Novak in New Orleans, Visual Communications in Los Angeles, all are evidence of, of this tradition. From 1986 to 1995, Tony led filmmaking workshops at Scribe Video Center in Philadelphia that guided filmmakers through the foundational phases of filmmaking, the conceptualization and planning, creating the groundwork that allowed filmmakers to build a base to move forward with the cinematic embodiment of an idea. Hers was a workshop about narrative construction but also a workshop that allowed community members, many time first time makers, to understand who they were in the world, what history and intelligence they brought to the table, their lineage as cultural workers, and an effort to clarify what they wanted uh, to say and who they were talking to, to identify and name their authenticating audience. A wide range of folks passed through Tony's workshops, filmmakers like Aisha Shahida Simmons, Nadine Patterson, Margie Strasser, Emmy Tunoka, Teresa Jackson, Nikki Harmon, uh, Ian La Van Zant, Ishimu Jaramoji, Tina Morton, and Zadi Keita. You may notice that the list of names is overwhelmingly female, and that Tony's way of working beckoned a womanist perspective that, that had really not had space or permission. What Tony promised from the workshop was that the filmmaker would have a doable script, a plan of action. What most of the participants got was a collaborator who continued to work with them through the production and post-production of their projects. 
The wonderful word workshop made it clear that though this was a learning space, this was serious work with the goal of a finished work used as a creative tool in community building. There are similarities in Tony's role as a workshop facilitator and instructor to her role as editor in organizing anthologies that, that, that Minda talked about. She understood her work as not only providing a platform for creativity, but helping construct that platform and pulling folks up onto it to share their stories with the broader community. Um, one of the workshops project, workshop projects developed at Scribe, which Tony was pivotal in launching, was a program called Community Visions. This program had as its goal to help uh, members of community organizations use the documentary as a creative way to better reach their constituencies, but also to teach the language of documentary filmmaking and the skills of production so that the groups would have those skills within their organization. The members of the community group served as the writers, directors, camera and sound people, editors, but the projects were facilitated by, by filmmakers. Tony facilitated films with several groups in Philadelphia. Uh, we're gonna look at an excerpt of, of a film that was created by United Hands Community Land Trust that, con that Tony co-facilitated with Chris Emanuelides. Again, this is a video guided by Tony in some ways serving as the kind of executive producer, but all the production work was done by this group ranging from age eight to 80. And you can actually hear a little of Tony's voice in the narration. So I'm gonna share screen again and hopefully get this together, hold on. Homeownership, 
Sweat Equity is one part of the program, and it's our personal and collective investment in the community. Politica del abandono, policies of neglect, unemployment, abandoned houses, factories. There are 1,200 vacant houses in Philadelphia, churches, and most of them are right here in Kensington. Communal ownership of the land is part of the vision of United Hands Community Land Trust. But what is the point of having title to a devastated area? Yeah, well, we're about the business of creating change in the area and not for the speculators, Thank and you. not for still another renewal program Please. or model cities or gentrification. We challenge the banks, private organizations, foundations, and the people who live here. Because banks aren't going to abide by the Community Reinvestment Act unless they're confronted. Folks got to get past the idea that we don't have the resources to create solutions. Or we don't have the right. Yeah. You know, it's big business exploiting the poor. Yeah, and who are we to decide for ourselves, much less be in control? Mm. We are rehabbing our properties around this area. We decided to come together with the community and start cleaning the empty lots. Today we're working on 12 feet and 8 feet. Because we're not going to wait for the politician, because if we wait for the politician, they're not going to do what we're going to do as a community. No, no. Like we said, nobody gets off the hook. Not the banks, not the Office of Housing, or the politicians, or ourselves either. <laughs> well, get it done. Little by little. I like the streets to be clean. And the last time we will have some trouble to play at, and then we don't have to give out all these bad drug dealers. Hey, we told the city. Oh, yeah, man. Bring them bulldozers in here. <laughs>
Okay. Um, and yeah, so um, I, I worked on, on several films together uh, with Tony, among them The Bombing of Osage Avenue, Cecil B. Moore, uh, Come As You Are, and W.E.B. Du Bois, A Biography in Four Voices, as well as a number of, of short films that we made through Scribe. Tony took on the role of writer, creating a structure to these films and definitely giving directorial vision. She also narrates several of these films. Although Walter Cade, who we see in, in, the, in, in, in the earlier clip, Tony's brother, talks of uh, a serious interest in film that goes back to, to childhood, it was the community workshops at the Studio Museum in Harlem, also for Tony, that were, were, where she first studied film in, I guess, the late 1960s, early 70s, I believe with Nio Killingsworth. Her voice and vision and understanding really made Tony a major inspiration in the third world independent cinema movement. She collaborated with John Acumfra on Seven Songs for Malcolm, with Francis Negron Montana on uh, Brincando El Charco, with Pearl Bowser on Midnight Ramble. She embraced and was embraced by filmmakers of color nationally and internationally, and was a frequent theorist and speaker at gatherings. Because her way of working involved an intertwining of culture, extraordinary research and analysis, she was really thinking about what we as filmmakers of color were doing and how by connecting to our, uh, to our authenticating audiences, we might do it better. Uh, I wanna close by presenting an excerpt from an audio recording of a keynote address given by Tony in September, 1989 at the Show the Right Thing conference sponsored by the New York State Council on the Arts. This was one of the largest, most fabulous late 20th, 20th century gatherings of independent filmmakers of color in the US, Asian Americans, African Americans, uh, Latinx, uh, Palestinian Americans, progressive uh, uh, Euro Americans. Uh, so let's take a listen and uh, that's it. So this is a quick cut, which I will find here. Many of us came to the documentary, animation, reportage, criticism, programming, fundraising, experimental, dramatic film or video making on half inch, three quarter, eight, 16, 35 millimeter, not to mention Fisher Price camera cord for $87 at Toys R Us. Many of us came to the work out of self-defense. That is, we were driven to the work by various kinds of terrorists. In schools, for example, by the thugs of a linguistic purity syndicate that told us you're not allowed to speak Spanish on school grounds, you don't speak good English, that's not proper French, either speak or sit down because that speaky, squeaky little bitty voice you have, no one can hear it. You need remedial English, you need two courses in speech, you can't expect to get certified until you get rid of that accent. And that book, that poem, that film you're about to bring into this classroom is not on the improved curriculum because for American literature, American history, American cinema, because it is not standard, not correct, not traditional, not conventional, not American. And so in defense, we picked up the camera, many of us. Others of us came to the work simply because we were trying to escape being taken hostage by those four white guys. Those four white guys who will sit behind the desk nightly talking to us through that piece of furniture we bought in our homes for reasons other than being mystified or ambushed. Because we wanted maybe to hear some news in order to develop critical awareness of what we need to know to lead enlightened lives. But those four white guys keep talking that ghost talk, those statements that have no responsible actors in them, no pictures moving around them in them, as in, the unemployment rate is said to be not increasing. And you try to hold on to the pick, what you saw in your neighborhood, um, the senior workers picketing the front of the department store for having been laid off six months shy of their pension, or the workers standing around down at the bottling plant, or rather what used to be the bottling plant, but the gate is closed, and now a very self-important, very large padlock is on the gate. And it's another runaway plant situation to Guatemala, they say. And the guy in the cap in the silvery Katina eatery on wheels thing is handing out coffee by way of expressing solidarity with the workers. 
and some of the men who live on the vents on the subway grates walk over to join the conversation. You try to hold on some of, to some of these everyday pictures while those four white guys are talking eraser English. And it really gets spooky listening to sentence after sentence with no pictures and no active subjects in those sentences or somebody named who could be responsible for the treacherous things going on that is being masked by the aforementioned English or English. And then you start thinking of things like the free press, as they say, 29 corporations owning over half of all media magazines, newspapers, radio, TV, Hollywood studios. And then you add to that the fact that nearly 65%, more than 65% of all TV, all movies, all college tech books that are shoved down the throats of third world came out of this country. And they are force fed in that one way exchange that is probably a model for international dialogue as manifested in Tarzan movies and so forth. So you begin thinking about the free press and the rest of the media that are accountable to their owners, their advertisers, but never to us, that rely on government and other established authorities for timely tips and some sense of credibility and respectability, and remind ourselves again that they signed the Pentagon Code and they're trying to avoid controversy, and by now it's absolutely entrenched habit to frame all issues in terms of communist menace. So the four white guys are talking to me about South Africa and Lebanon and Nicaragua and China and so, of course, you pick up the camera because we have got to know, we have got to inform each other, we have got to know what is going on. You pick up the camera and you learn to plug in the projector. And the main thing that is important to show are the transformation dramas, the documentaries, the experimentals, the narratives, the shorts, the longs that speak to the capacity of ordinary people to alter the power configurations, to change the circumstances therein. It is in fact the drama that does hallmark not only the independent, and I'm talking about the people of color, colored people's stuff here and throughout the world. It is one of the things that it hallmarks our, our folklore, it tends to pop up in all our figures, and I'm thinking again of Anansi and Coyote, it's characteristic, it's characteristic of the aesthetic, it's characteristic of the cosmology, if you will. That's it. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Louis. So we are holding uh, such uh, incredible presentations uh, to consider in, in reflecting. We are officially in the school of Tony K. Bambara here. Um, I just want to name uh, immense gratitude that Karma and Zoe are here with us and that we have many friends and scholars um, of uh, Tony's life, of uh, CUNY, of uh, Black feminism, African diasporic cultural work. So this is a really extraordinary event and we're just going to get right into the, the question and, and answer and dialogue section. So um, I want to invite uh, everyone, please feel free to use the chat um, to be able to share a question or a comment. If you may wish to uh, get onto the mic to share some thoughts, then feel free to put your name down just as I had done. And anyone who is tuning in uh, who um, uh, is a Spanish speaker, then please put your question or comment in the chat so that we can also uh, translate it for um, for English speakers in the room. So, um, and we'll get to hear from uh, a couple of people uh, in the audience before we kick it back to the presenters. So uh, I invite you all, any questions, any comments in the chat or on the mic, uh, it would be wonderful to hear some reflections that people have from these presentations. And I see uh, Sonia is getting us started. A few questions uh, for, for some of the presenters. Uh, Sonia writes, Ms. Holmes, in writing the biography, were there particular aspects of Bambara's life that you felt, to co that you felt compelled to explore in greater depth? Dr. Lewis, what is your perspective on the role of community in Bambara's fiction collection, The Seabirds Are Still Alive? And Ms. Mr. Massia, what is your perspective on Bambara's screenplays and the classes she taught at the Scribe Center? So some initial food for thought. 
I wonder if anyone else has a, a question or comment before we kick it back to the presenters. I see Brian also add TCB's work functions so powerfully for political education. Several of her stories have incredible insight into the internal dynamics of organizations, and she made critical connections with organizations and movements rooted in community and internationally. As I've learned about her, I've always admired what seemed to be her non-sectarian orientation, but I have also been curious if she had been doing this as a joiner or if she saw her role as a cultural worker as necessarily independent. So another important question, was Tony able to have such a far reach because of a somewhat independent or on autonomous nature or was she a part of different organizations? Um, so maybe that can be a, a couple of questions to be able to get us started. I wonder if anyone, any of the presenters would like to, to weigh in on some of the questions that have been offered so far. Well, um, I can start with the um, the last comment slash question from Brian. I think um, one of the things that was highlighted in all of our presentations this evening is the idea of um, Tony K. Bambara's sort of spirit of community. And so I think when I think about her um, and, and her work, I don't necessarily, I don't think of it at all as being independent um, I think we can say joiner um, as far as uh, her belief that everything is interdependent. And so, um, you know, her, her need to, to work to connect people to um, all aspects of, of their lives and their communities and, and cultures and, and whatever spheres that they were a part of to, to do the best um, that they could to to form connections not only within their communities but um, other communities as well and I think she um, definitely did that uh, leading by example. I'm curious, Linda, if you'd like to share so we can get to hear you live. Owen, oh, um, okay. yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Um, thanks for the question. Um, listening to Lewis Messiah, I was just reminded again of the breadth and depth of Tony's work and life. So the question of was there other things that are that I would like to have included in the biography that I did not include in the biography, I think that um, you know welcoming Tabidi Lewis's work, I think that there will be volumes yet to come about. Tony K. Bambara's life and about Tony K. Bambara's uh, work um, in all of the dimensions that she was working in. Um, and I think I should mention, since um, Karma is in the conversation, that my, the beginning of my work actually began with conversations with Karma. Mm. And um, Karma, at some point, um, shortly after Tony's death, decided to deposit uh, letters and artifacts to Spelman College archives. And that's where the collection, um, organized collection of uh, the primary resources are on Tony K. Bambara. And the letters alone, I mean, that's another, that's another wonderful book, I think, that is yet to come, the correspondence. Um, Tony, when I talk about Tony's phone book is like being the internet before the internet, right? Tony really knew the world. Um, you know, she traveled, um, as Lewis mentioned, I and mean, she was very international. I mean, she went to Cuba, she went to Vietnam. Um, so there is, um, I think, a lot more to be done in terms of understanding Tony in terms of international work. Um, we have the salt eaters in terms of exploring. I think that is one area that I would have liked to have dived into more is understanding um, what that vision was that she was talking about in the fiction of creating the seven sisters and where that might have um, gone or how that might have been developed. But we are just at the beginning, I think, of the possibilities of inspiration for dance, for music, for fiction, for biography 
uh, for film um, that that Tony Cates bombard his life and work and uh, you know will generate ultimately. And I think the other thing in terms of thinking about Tony is also what I talked about, which is that um, you know being inspired by Tony is not necessarily expanding on the print or expanding on the film, but it's also doing the work, doing the cultural work. And so um, that's kind of how I'm continuing, uh, not so much in terms of thinking about another book, but thinking about uh, the cultural work that uh, continues to inform my life based on having known Tony K. Bambara. Thank you, Linda. Viti or Louie, if you'd like to uh, yeah. jump in. A and couple of um, Go ahead. A couple of questions. One was, um, and I think I broached it when I was speaking, how has Bambara's uh, life or philosophies impacted, how has impacted you? Uh, I would say for me, uh, and it's really crazy because I spent um, about, you know, over a decade between publishing the, the um, conversations uh, and then this text and doing other projects, but really uh, in so many ways, how I think about patriarchy, how I think about uh, liberation, how I think about a commitment to uh, the value of people uh, over money, how I think about being patient and what does it mean to help mentor people and them coming into consciousness and self on their own terms. Uh, you know, I, I, I was talking about the story, the lesson, and people go, oh, a children's story. No, that's a that's a story about how do you come into revolutionary consciousness and what are the, the, the stages of that and how does one just navigate and guide that and, and deal with people on their own terms and, you know, how is it sustainable, right? I can tell you uh, about uh, uh, Paulo Fieri's ideas, but if I can guide you into seeing and being critical and your own contradictions, uh, which is the case with the young protagonist, you know, at, she's at a crossroads at the end. And so, you know, for me, Bambara has, has really been, you know, very much about how I think about faith, uh, which is the spiritual wholeness dynamic that I lay out. You know, what do I think about family, right? And, and what do we understand liberation and freedom to be about? And, uh, and so someone asked you know, me to question the role of community in the seabirds. Uh, when you look at a story like The Apprentice, you see the role of community coming together, but also this notion of community and leadership. Who leads the community? And that you know, community must have many leaders for it to be successful, right? Uh, the seabirds, this sort of uh, transnational perspective of you know struggle and liberation that comes through in that piece, and that there's you know always this need within communities for you know people functioning as mentors. Um, uh, I, I, I'm I'm sorry, I was talk I meant to talk in the Apprentice is what I, I was talking about the organizer's wife in the first, but in the Apprentice is a perfect example of this young activist being cultivated in what does it mean to really make an impact uh, mm -hmm. within the community and that everyone is important and has something to offer, right? And um, uh, the role of community is that. Again, leaders and lessons and cultural models can come from anyone and, and anywhere. And that we are uh, we are we are always in this. We should always be in this process of of becoming, you know, of becoming. Right? It's it's uh, and I talk about this all the time. And I think when you see Bambara's work, this idea of a uh, of a gerund, right? Uh, so so that that's what I think about with her and her impact on me, and uh, you know, her fiction, you know that. The community, uh, and everyone has talked about this, is that there are so many lessons and so to be learned in so many figures, and that no one is unimportant. You know, no one is unimportant. So when you look at the body of her work, no one is unimportant. And if you ignore people, you're missing the richest contributors and aspects of the community, and you're missing an opportunity to grow and actually, you know, move towards some level of freedom. Thank you for that. 
Louis, would you like to jump in? Should we get to hear from some more questions or something coming to mind? Sure, no, I, I was just thinking that, uh, you know, to be these uh, reflection on, on, on the literature is also true, I think, in the way Tony moved through the world and, and, and lived her life in terms of um, everyone was important and everyone, and I think it slowed her down in all honesty because she, she really focused and gave and, and she, she took everyone seriously, which is, which is pretty extraordinarily demanding. Uh, and, 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 and all, but she did it, but she was also very generous, you know, in, in, in doing that. Um, I mean, I, 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 I do think that, uh, you know, just, you know, those of us who have become acquainted with Tony through her literature, through knowing her, through her films, she, she, there is something that really sticks. And uh, when, when, when Makiba was, was talking earlier about, about uh, uh, you know, Tony's uh, kind of raising up, you know, the, the power and sometimes the tyranny of language. Uh, Tony, I think, Tony gave us new way, new ways of hearing. I mean, and you get it from from reading her work, and you get it from from just the way she interacted and 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 the way she spoke. So, yeah, I mean, the 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 the, the, the there, there, there are so there are many many gifts. There are many many gifts that uh, have, that that one gets from uh, uh, being acquainted with with, with uh, Tony K. Bombara. And I'm seeing uh, several more questions in the chat um, with gratitude to everyone for thinking together on her legacy, thinking about um, Jocelyn asks, it was fascinating to hear Toni Morrison's resistance to Toni's multiplicity. So just a writer, also an organizer, also a filmmaker. What do you all make of that? Um, and thinking about the breadth and depth of Toni's legacy as, as Linda had, pre had presented. Cleaver also asks, in your own daily lives, what are some ways that you embody Tony K. Bambara's revolutionary practices? Uh, there was a question by the Free Black Library about uh, can the archives of Bambara be accessed uh, by the general public? And there's a couple of uh, comments below, including a shout out to Holly Smith and Cassandra Ware, who were at Spelman College Library. Um, Danica has the question, how has Bambara's work as an educator shaped your approach to teaching in schools, community spaces, and elsewhere? And then another question to consider by Jerry, did Bambara provide insights about how to deal with incarceration? So um, thinking about those questions together, if anyone has any thoughts to, to offer in response. Can I? respond and I'm going to steal from Linda. Linda, we were having a conversation and you told me about, you talked to me, and I, and I know this was you, about Tony teaching at Spelman and them canceling and her course on uh, Black women writers being canceled and her saying, okay, and she just started it without the approval of the institution from her home. And it really blew me away. Uh, and so you asked, how do we model that? Just recently here, there's an organization called SEI and um, we uh, they do this work around um, sport culture. And I took a portion of my book, Tony Cake, of a, a race and sport and taught for a week with the young people there. And basically, you know, there was, there was not a, an issue of getting paid, but just, this is what we do because this is what we're supposed to do, right? Uh, and um, so, you know, that, and then I remember Eugene Redman telling me the story of Tony K coming to St. Louis to give a talk. And he, he, she gave a talk and he was like, okay, that's it. And then he said a week later, he saw her walking around or five days later, St. Louis. And he's like, what are you still doing here? Well, she, <laughs> and then she ended up talking with some of the local people who were organizing and literally, uh, you know, just was helping them out and was still hanging out there. And so, you know, after reading her interviews and the stories and talking to people, it doesn't surprise me, but it's back to what, what Lewis talked about of, 
if you're here with me in this space, you are important and you see it in the stories, you know, every, every human being is important. And so that's the lesson, you know. I think I've been thinking about Tony a lot um, in terms of where we are as a nation right now um, and trying to hold on to optimism. And so um, one of the things that was amazing to me about Tony was her ability to be eternally optimistic and um, not in the sense of um, believing in America or uh, believing in any particular party, Democratic, Republican, or whatever, but believing always that change was possible and that um, organizing wherever you are. I remember there was one day I, I called Tony and I was working at the State Health Department directing an Office of Minority and Multicultural Health. And I was like, uh, I got to get out of here. Um, this is ridiculous. You know, why should I stay here? And she responded, organize where you are. Organize where you are. Um, so that was an important lesson for me um, at that time. Another time I called and I said, oh, Tony, you know, like this was in the 70s. And it seemed like, um, you know, after the revolutionary fervor of the 60s, that we were going through a whole other kind of experience. And I said, Tony, I mean, there's nothing going on. Um, the, the, you know, the fervor of the 70s, as the 60s has kind of played out. And she said, who are you talking to? Who are your friends? And then she said, and what are you reading? <laughs> you know, and so, and that was when, at that, and, and that was a turning point in my, in my reading in that Tony asked me who I was reading and I mentioned a couple of black authors and she said, I didn't hear anything about Asian writers or Latina writers or indigenous writers. Um, so, you know, you need to get some, some other folks on your reading list. Um, and I've always wondered in terms of the book, I've always wondered, Tony, and I think Lewis was talking about this a little bit, gave so much that I, you know, how, how did she, if she were still alive now in her older years, to talk with her about how she was able to keep that fire going mm -hmm. and where she, she was able to sustain that energy and that um, ability to have that conversation and respect for whoever it is that she happened to meet and to see a place for them um, in the revolution by them going into themselves, but helping them with that plan and helping them to actualize it. Yeah. But um, I just wanted to say about the prison work, and then I'm going to be quiet, is oh, that Tony did a lot of prison work, <laughs> um, and I'm, which is not to answer the question directly, because I, I, I'm not going to try to, I think it would be hard for me to try to, to guess that. But I mean, I think we can guess that based on what Tony's writing is, but Tony did a lot of um, work in, in writing workshops in women's prisons. Um, Alderson prison was one of the places. And one of the stories in, in Joyous Revolt was um, how there was a sister who was a wonderful writer in prison, had no place to stay, right? And so when Tony's in um, Atlanta, she welcomes her into her house. And not only does she welcome her into her house, but she connects her with writing groups um, she um, involves her in community activities, not, and again, it's not she, it's providing the space, making the interconnections. Um, but Tony was very committed to, to, I mean, to the prison work, to the union work, to the women's health work. There was just, it was endless, totally incredible. Thank you for that. And we have a, a request from Zoe Bambara, if you'd like to share some thoughts as well. Zoe and Karma, you've got the floor. Hi, uh, my mom's hiding. But... <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy that y'all are here. But um, I just wanted um, to speak that someone asked about how um, my grandmother influenced them. I was like, I should say something. Uh, so like, everybody knows I live in Atlanta, um, born and raised, and I've been doing a lot of um, nonprofit work here in Atlanta actually in my first year of college as well. So um, she's definitely influenced me to use not only my platform, but my voice 
um, in all spaces. Uh, I've been working, I'm a fellow at this organization that focuses on free college and um, um, and fighting for student basic needs because Georgia has a really big student hunger and homelessness problem. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been working on that and I work for this fellow, um, this organization that works for um, people who are incarcerated. It's called Education Not Incarceration. Um, so I've been learning, learning about the prison system basically. Um, and she's definitely, well, this is the only reason why I do the work, honestly. Um, I guess it's a way for me and a way to heal because I never met her. Um, but also it's just something I'm really passionate about because of course I grew up at Stillman. <laughs> definitely grew up at Stillman, grew up around people who um, just the black feminists that I really enjoy listening to and just looking at, sorry, my dad's playing his game. Definitely hear him. <laughs> but um, <laughs> around um, just such powerful women has definitely impacted me um, so greatly. And it's so funny. People are like, oh, here's Zoe go. If you say something wrong, <laughs> I'm going to speak on it. And I'm like, oh, I don't think that's right. Um, but she's definitely impacted me in such a beautiful way. And I can't wait to keep doing the work that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Oh my gosh, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> and if you may wish to share in the chat if there's a URL for Educate Not Incarcerate in Georgia, any of the work that you're doing, please let us know. Okay, I'll drop my um my Instagram so you guys can kind of see the stuff that I, I'm up to. So if you would like to join or help in any type of way, I would love that. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Karma. Would you like to share any words or, or you want to hang back? The floor, the floor is yours if you'd like. I usually hang back, so <laughs> I'll continue. <laughs> but thank you guys. I'm so happy that y'all are here. Absolutely. And I love that uh, hearing from Zoe that uh, you grew up at Spelman College. For those of y'all who don't know, there is an annual or almost annual Tony K. Bambara conference that happens at Spelman. And uh, Makiba and I uh, were able to spend time with Beverly, Dr. Beverly Guy Sheftall and others who uh, have basically a liberatory uh, institution at Spelman. And uh, one of the phrases that was recurrent in the conference was, you are invited to be ignited. And so uh, I'm hoping that everyone is feeling that, is feeling that fire uh, to do. Um, we just have a, a couple more, you are invited to be ignited. We just have a, a couple more uh, minutes. I wonder if uh, any of the speakers would like to share any final words um, as we come to a close. I, I shouldn't say this because, but because you have to live up to it. But uh, I, I am screening supposedly the finished film <laughs> at this upcoming uh, <laughs> scholar activist gathering. <laughs> Uh, I've got a lot to do. So anyway, Thank did you, you say what did you you said you are screening it? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm so excited. <laughs> the TCB School of Organizing. Please keep your your eyes and ears out. Um, uh, go ahead. If I was, so that, I was asking, uh, is that in March, Lewis? Yeah, it's 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 the weekend of Tony's birthday, which Tony was March twenty fifth. So it's, it's it's I think either the weekend before or after during the screening. And uh, Makiba or Tabiti or Linda, if you have any final comments. And I, I would just like to to thank. Um, the City College, the Tony K, the School of Tony K. Bambara uh, folks for bringing us together. My goodness, I mean, this has been, and then Zoe and then, I mean, uh, the questions, um, I, I, this is quite remarkable. I mean, I, I, I mean, I could tear up a little bit here, so I'm just gonna- and Like all the folks in the chat, you know, like Sue Ross and <laughs> like wonderful city, everybody. Yeah, this this has been an honor, and um, is that the spirit is right, is strong, and uh, it's it's Tony, and you know, uh, it's making every time I'm in these spaces, I'm lamenting that I never got a chance to meet her uh, personally, you know, but I definitely feel that she's part of my my life, and and there are so many 
wonderful projects yet to be done about Tony Cade, uh, Bambara. Uh, you know, there really are. So uh, hopefully more, more writers, more scholars, more community activists will pick up pen or camera to focus on her. I just want to echo what everyone else said. You know, I mean, it's just nobody likes Zoom right now, but it's been wonderful sharing space with all of you. Um, Connor, you know, whenever I think of Tony Cape Bambara's legacy as a cultural worker, you are the first person that comes to mind. So I just wanted to tell you that and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Makiba. Some uh, hard, hard words to, to try to lift up to, but. Um, uh, absolutely deeply indebted to you all. Um, I want to just share uh, uh, gratitude once again. So please a round of applause for all of the speakers. Um, also gratitude to the sign language and Spanish interpreters and Wendy Subway, uh, Sunny and Rachel. We have the final two events for this residency. They'll be in late January. On Wednesday, January 20th, we'll have an event Transforming CUNY Admissions, Studies, and Movements. And on Friday, January 29th, an event called Decolonize CUNY and NYC. I encourage y'all to stay connected with Wendy Subway on social media and at wendysubway.com, where you can find out more info about this residency, including a featured readings list for further studies. And if any of you may wish to share this event recording or to watch the first four events that we've had, go to Wendy Subway's YouTube channel. But for now, please take care. Everyone, please stay healthy out there, stay moving, and we'll continue the learning and liberation work that we have gotten to get such inspiration from Tony and all of those who she's connected to continue to do in our own lives. So thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night, thank you. Good night, thank you. Merci. Merci. Gracias. I'm Malika. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.